Okay, so by way of a little introduction. So I, I mentioned in the uh, promo video that this is partially connected to the Sima Rambam. Uh, a couple, what is it now? How long ago was Lagboimer? Last week. Last week. Last week we started a new it? cycle week, of exactly a week. We started a new cycle of learning the Rambam three chapters a day. So last week, sometime we learned this chapter. Now that would often connect this opening to the ending of Rambam. The end of Rambam, Rambam describes excuse me, the messianic era. And uh, there he the concluding line is that when at that time when Mashiach comes, the occupation of the world will be nothing other than the knowledge of God, that will be the world's occupation. Well, what is the knowledge of God? Well, open up the first chapter, you'll discover what the knowledge of God is. Number one. The second thing to say is, Rambam is unique in many ways, his book of Halacha. And one of the ways in which his book of Halacha is unique is that it's the first and maybe even the only in some ways, but certainly the first halachic work to give halachic definition to Jewish ideas, philosophy, and theology. There are many books of Jewish philosophy that make argumentatives about, uh, about the, the revelation at Sinai, arguments about the nature of creation, arguments about the presence of God in our lives, and so on and so forth, or even arguments about proper ethical philosophy and whatever. But none of them give like halachic parameters. Here is what the definitionally what the like, so to speak, halakhic requirement is to think or to believe or to know. No, no one has done that before the Ramba. In the same way there's a definition, tefillin has to be X size and X color and X shape and X information. Okay, so the Torah says belief in God. Well, what is that? Let's give it some definition. Shukhar, what do I have to know? So the Shukhar has practical stuff. In fact, the, the book, Chayva uh, Salavava's Duties of the Heart, in his introduction, he says exactly that. He says there's many books that discuss the duties of the limb, like what are my obligations that I have to do with my body physically, put on the film, keep Shabbos, and so on. But there's not much on the duties of the heart. So he writes a book called Duties of the Heart. But Rambam puts them together in one book. In one book, he wants to cover all of Jewish observance, and that includes Jewish thinking. So he's the first one to codify Jewish theology. So in some ways, because of that, so the first thing he's going to do, of course, is going to codify the thinking of what God is, because it's going to be the first thing to know, the first mitzvah, to know that there's a God. And in some ways, therefore, it's much more concise than, say, his book on philosophy, Marinavuch, The Guide to the Perplexed, which is outright a book on philosophy. It'll be much more elaborate. But here in his book of Allah, it's very concise. Here is what you have to think. So we're going to go through a little bit and unpack some of the arguments that are embedded in these halachic statements, a lot of which come from Marinavuch, some from the Rasag, and from other places. So first, um, so you see we're in the bold, the second bold line, which says, Hilchus Yisoy Da'atera. You can start from the top of the page, actually. He opens up the book. Every one of the 14 books of Jewish law, he opens up with a verse. And here it goes, the verse, M'shoi chastachalei duchav, it says, K'sechalei shelev. Draw forth your kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to those who are upright in heart. So this verse is all about uh, relationship with God in terms of feelings for God, understanding of God. So this is an appropriate verse. Right. And you write Sefer Edition, the first book of the 14 books. Who is Sefer Mada? This is the book of knowledge or character or Mada means like uh, thinking. It's not, you're reading from here? The top, right yeah. There, right? Top. Second line. Then he says, Hilchais of Chamesh. There are five sets of laws in this book. This is the order. First is Hilchais of Sada laws of the foundations of Torah. Hilchais Deus, laws of knowledge. Laws of character, Deus. Hilchais Tama Torah, laws of Torah study. Hilchais of Sada the Chukas Agayim, laws of idol worship, and then Hachas the laws of Teshuvah. Okay, so the first of the five sets of laws in the book of Mada is the laws of the foundation of Torah. So now let's see. Hilchas Yisodak Torah Hakdama, introduction to the laws of the foundations of Torah, uh, the foundations of Torah. So all, every one of the Rambam's laws will begin with this introduction. They'll begin with the title of the introduction. Well, first of all, the book will, will begin with a verse. The book, it'll then list all the laws that are going to become in this book. And then he'll say, okay, first set of laws, the laws and the foundations of Torah. So let's say, I don't know, the book of Zmanim, which covers like the calendar, it'll say, uh, it'll have a verse. It'll say the book of Zmanim have X number of laws, laws of Shabbos, laws of Yom Tif, laws of Yom Kippur, laws of Pesach, whatever. And in the beginning of each set of laws, he'll say, here are the mitzvahs that are going to be covered in this set of laws. So which mitzvahs are covered in 
Hilchus is Sayyidah Torah. Hilchus is Sayyidah Torah, the laws of the foundations of Torah. Yesh Bachlolam, we're going to incorporate in this set of laws, Eser Mitzvahs, 10 Mitzvahs. Sheish Mitzvahs, say seven positive commandments, thou shalt. But Arba Mitzvahs, Lois, say, and four negative commandments, thou shalt not. And here are the details of these 10 commandments. Now, today, we're going to be looking at the first three. The first three of these mitzvahs are covered in chapter one of the laws of the foundations of Torah. And the first three mitzvahs are like this. Aleph, mitzvah number one. Leda, to know, sheyesham eleka, that there is out there a God. Mitzvah number one. Commandment. So, we once did a series a couple of years back on why is there a commandment to know God? Is the knowledge of God not an a priori to commandments? Because commandments implies a commander. So what's commandment number one, to believe in the commander? So what exactly is the nature of this mitzvah? Good question, and we discussed that elsewhere, but we're not going to go down there right now. But for now, we're going to highlight the fact, this is what's necessary for reading the Rambam as you go forward, is Rambam writes the words, Leda, to know that there is a God, not to believe. It doesn't say you should believe there's a God, but you should know there's a God. The difference between faith, believe, or know, to believe something is, I can't explain it, but this is what I accept as true. Whereas to know something, well, there's just two ways you can know something. Either you can know something because you've encountered it, so I know the cup is here, I'm looking at it, or I can know something by logical deduction. I know that one plus one equals two. And then I can deduce from there all kinds of mathematical equations that I know, not because I met them, but because I've logically deduced based on the data in front of me. So obviously in the case of God, he's going to demonstrate you cannot see God. So what's the knowledge of God going to be come from? It must therefore come from logical reasoning. So we have to, number one, uh, give some sort of definition as to what exactly God is, and then see if we can reason our way to that being. That's what Ramam is basically going to be doing. He doesn't unpack it in that way. He just gives the conclusions. But what I hope to do here is look at those conclusions and unpack the thinking that brought him to those conclusions. So it's going to give us a real strong, solid foundation to understand what is God. Well, and if it, what's the knowledge? Yeah, sorry? Yeah, the same thing with yeah. Shana, all again, yeah. You have to know what it's all about. That's right. So that's mission number one, to know there's a God. Mission number two is, Shalayala b'machshava sheyesham alaka achaz it should not enter your thought. You should not consider the notion that there's another God other than God himself, other than the, other than the God. That too will be explained. And number three, for our purposes, is layachtai. Literally means to unify him, or better yet, to understand God's unity. So there's two separate mitzvahs in terms of what we, the positive commandments, right? The negative is that there shouldn't be any other gods. But the positive are two. A, to know there's a God, and then B, to know the nature of his God. It is one, and what that union is, what that unity, what that oneness is. This is what we're going to be covering in chapter one. So he goes on to list the other mitzvahs, love God, fear God, sanctify God's name, not to desecrate God's name, not to destroy a paper that has God's name written on it, to listen to the prophets, and not to test the prophets. Those come in the later chapters of the laws of the foundations of Torah, not for our purposes. For our purposes, looking just at the first chapter, it's these three mitzvahs. To know there's a God, logically reason, understand that, to understand and there is no other God, and then to understand the nature of God, this unity, this oneness of God. Why should you be like a son, not just sitting there doing it? That's Sorry? There's Ach Hashem and there's just doing it. It's like, it does, like a better than ever. He doesn't want you to be just following commands. He wants you also to... Right. But Yachta means to know, not like you become one with him, a separate not mitzvah, sure enough, right? which comes actually, stuff comes in Hosdeus, which is to connect to God and follow God's ways. That's in Hilchas Deus. Yeah, Here is to true. know the one, the nature of God's oneness. Oh, that way? Yeah, I'm that's Yichud yuch, Hashem. It's a mitzvah, Achtas Hashem, to know the oneness of Hashem. So there's, there's yeah. two reasons, there's many reasons, but just for the purposes of our little discussion here, there's really two, like, almost objectives in what we're going to be doing in these classes. One is, first of all, we have to understand this stuff. We're believing Jews. What do we believe? Right? Now, even if we know it already, it's important to re-articulate and sharpen our understanding of these things. That's uh, number one. And number two is, especially if any of us are privileged here to be learning Hasidus, in many ways, the, the oneness of Hashem described in Hasidus, Achtos Hashem, 
starts after you understand this chapter in many ways. After you understand the depth of Rambam's logic here, then al Rebbe goes in Shara Yuchid Vamunan, the gate of oneness and faith, unity and faith, part two of Tanya, and takes everything Rambam said here to a step further. So another reason why it's good to do these classes now, because within the next uh, week or so, we're going to be starting in our daily learning of Tanya, part two of Tanya, which is going to discuss the unity and the oneness of Hashem. And that presupposes you understand what he says here in this chapter, specifically. And this chapter here is going to describe the oneness of Hashem in and of itself. God as a, as a unified being in and of itself. al Rebbe takes it a step further and describes that unity that Rambam describes, how that oneness of Hashem permeates all of creation. It's the next step. It's the next revelation. The revelation of Hasidus reveals the oneness of Hashem, not just as an abstract truth that God is a singular being, as Rambam is going to describe it, but step further, that that oneness is to be found in all the fragmented parts of creation. And that's what the whole 12 chapters of Shariq al Munna is to labor over this idea. And even though there's a singular God, there's a multiple, and there's a, crea there's a creation of multiplicity, all this variant multiplicity is reflective of and permeated with the oneness of Hashem. So in that sense, al Rebbe expects you to have a proper understanding of this chapter before you begin. So if we truly understand this, and then we go to Shariq al we'll have a much better appreciation. There's, there's number three. Is it the same thing? There's bittel and there's the contrast. There's achas. Is it like that? There's no, the yichud means like as opposed yichud to yichud just doing the oneness of Hashem. No, the oneness of Hashem here means like I'm not a trinity, where God's comprised of three parts. We're gonna see. Okay, but it means understanding God's nature, not not my relationship with Hashem per se. Oh, I'm saying, but in relation, there's bittel and there's what? What's that's the that's Hasidic language already, not halacha. What's, what's the opposite? What? Bittel and what? I got yeshus. No, no, no. You do something because you. Oh, period, period. And what? Period. Kabbalah cell versus uh, one way you're just doing bittle because you're just doing it, and the other way you're doing it because you love to do it. It's not right. not. That's, that's like a Ben and Evid. Yeah, but what's the term? It's bittle and something else. It's unity. Ah, yeah, you, you, yeah, that's but that's that's a my yuchu with Hashem. Here's talking about the, to do both. I know yeah. this is here's talking about the nature of Hashem himself. Yeah. Okay, so let's now get to Aleph. I, I also should note another thing, just two things to two primary text that I'm relying on to explain and unpack most of these things. Um, the first is, there is a, a talk, a monumental talk from the Rebbe, in which the Rebbe breaks down the first two paragraphs of this set of law, the first two and three paragraphs of this laws here, of these halachas. The Rebbe breaks it down and demonstrates how in the words of Rambam has all the depth of Hasidus in an unbelievably beautiful way. And I'm going to borrow some of the concepts, and they're not all of them, because for whatever reason, we're going to, I'm going to borrow some of the concepts. Maybe one day we'll actually go through that essay. It's quite remarkable. That's the first text I rely heavily on. And the second is a book from the Tzimach Tzedek called Sefer HaKira. Tzimach Tzedek wrote a book called the Book of Philosophy. Hakira means philosophy or investigation. And over there, he uh, summarizes and rephrases and explains what Rambam says in this chapter, based on Marina Vuchim, Rambam's Guide to the Plex, based on Rapsadja Goings, and Monis Hideus, and other books of that era of Jewish philosophy. Okay, so with all that here, yeah. the bottom, Aleph. Yisoyda Yisoydus, it's the foundation of all foundations, Vamuda Chachbas, and a pillar of all wisdom. Right? You look at the first letters of this word, of these four words, Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, of the name of Hashem. The foundation of all foundations and the pillar of all knowledge, of all wisdom. The Rebbe in that essay gets through the details of every single one of these words. Why foundation of foundations? And then the pillar of all knowledge. Why not the foundations of foundations and knowledge? It goes through all of it. But not for now. So what is this great foundation? Lay that to know, sheyesham, that there is there, matzah yudishan, a primary being. The usage of the word there is an interesting usage. Obviously, it doesn't mean literally space, like spatially God's there and not here, but means there as in like a, exists. it exists. That's right. What exists? He doesn't use the word God. In fact, as we'll see, he doesn't use the word God until halacha number four. What he does say is the primary being. So this is the first thing we know about God. The first being, the primary being. Now, who this primary being, 
Mamsi Kalnimsa brings into being all else that exists. Number one, but two. So that, that's number two, sorry. The primary being, everything that exists, exists from him. So now we're talking about creation. The implication that there was a time when, create, when the world did not exist, and now it does, as opposed to philosophy of that time, which believed that just like God always exists, the world also always exists. There were those who didn't believe in God at all. The world always just always is and always will be. And then there were those who believed in God and said, well, God's like a shadow. I'm sorry, that, like the world is like a shadow to God. You know, just like shadows exist as long as the object itself exists. So, so too, the world exists as long as the creator exists. So in theory, a person can believe in a God, a primary being, but not believe in point two, that this primary being beings all beings into being, but that everything else exists side by side with the primary being as a natural result, like a shadow that always exists with the, with the item from that. Was that, was that a Jewish thought? No. The shadow? A lot of Jewish thought. Oh, okay. Philosophy thought. A lot of Jewish thought. No. Okay. Okay. Jewish thought. Right. So this is point two. Sorry. Well, yeah, but the world's not a shadow. But comparing to shadow is just an analogy. The point. Yeah, I know, but the point be being that it always exists parallel to God all the time. We're going to rationalize why that can't be the case. We're going to explain why that can't be the case. Now, the truth is, science has already discovered it's not the case, which is why they have the theory of evolution, because we see the world changing. We see the world getting better over time. So you, we have to conclude that it wasn't always here because if the world was always here, why did science get discovered now, not a billion years ago? Or not a trillion, or not a hundred trillion years ago. If it was always here and always will be, why at this juncture, right? So if we can observe change, why? Why did we have there's more people? people. Or That's the question. Okay, so if the answer is the world getting better. So there's things evolved. Ah, which, oh, that's exactly the point. So if things evolved, that means at a starting point. The community means it wasn't always here. If it was always here, there's no reason for it to change at any point and evolve to anything else. Why did you know it's evolution implies that a certain amount of time required for the evolution to happen, right? In that episode, in, right, in any evolution, yes, any evolution requires a certain amount of time in which that evolution happens. Any that's that, that's what evolution is, it's a time frame in which this change happens, right? That's the nature of any evolution. So, if we can see the world evolving, even in the sense that technology is evolving, not, not, not the uppercase e, but the lowercase e, then we can logically deduce that the world wasn't always here. Because otherwise, there's no reason for that evolution to happen now and not a trillion years ago or a hundred trillion years ago. Because a hundred trillion years ago, the world was just as far from its beginning as it is now because the world always was here. So why should the change happen now and not a hundred trillion years ago, right? So if we can observe change in the world, we have to reverse engineer and imagine that the change was constantly happening in the reverse. Hence the Big Bang Theory, right? So the, the, the notion of the Big Bang Theory, ironically, it's not a step away from God, it's a step closer to God. Because before Big Bang, they believed the world always was here. You don't need a creator, because the world is always here. But now that we understand this evolution, well, whoa, whoa, wasn't always here. There's a beginning. What's before the beginning? We haven't figured that out yet, but there's a beginning. So that's already a step closer to God rather than farther away. Following? So in other words, this definition is a primary being from which all beings emerge. That's something an evolutionary biologist would agree with. There's a primary being. We don't know what it is yet. But there's got to be some primary being from which everything else comes, right? Because there's, there's a causality in evolution. And you keep on wor working your way backwards to, to the most simple of causes. Are you following or not so much? You, you work your way backwards to the simplest causes. So you come down to two, to two particles. Simplest cause so far. Where do two particles come from? We don't know yet, but there's got to there's, there's gonna be a cause before that. And then when you figure out what that cause is, what are you going to do now? Find another cause. So you find another cause. So what point do you have to come to a point where there is no cause? It just starts here. That would be definitionally what he just said. A primary being from which all of the beings emerge. Following? So evolution is not a step away from God. It's a step closer. If we understand what God is in this sense. We're going to learn more about what the nature of Hashem. But at this point, I don't think an evolutionary thinker would disagree with this definition yet. The primary being. And, you know, I think uh, Aristotle's formulation was an unmovable mover, right? Because we see change, we see movement, and, and all movement implies causality. So you got to work your way back to a primary cause, a primary being from which all other beings emerge. 
Following? That definition one. But then he adds, and all that exists, heaven and earth, whatever that is, and everything between heaven and earth, don't find themselves only from him alone. Only from, what, from, the- only from the truth of his being. In other words, he's a primary being. Requires nothing else to exist, right? Because otherwise it would be the effect of some other cause, right? It's the primary cause. So that primary cause implies it needs no other to be. Otherwise, it would be some other causality <coughs> before him. It wouldn't be a primary being, right? Now, everything that exists comes from nothing other than him, implying that there is only one cause. And there's another rationality to, the, to leading us to the singularity of God, that there could only be one. Because if there's two, it says it's sorry, it says it's right, but what, why yeah, can't there be two? Why can't, you be, why can't there be two? Because if there's two, if there's two, then... The, the 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 ending point of one where the next one starts right implies that there's something outside of them that says you start here you end here and there has been another, then there's another, then there's another cause before it right so it's not simply that there's a primary cause from which everything else emerges but everything that emerges must come down to only one cause and not two where at the moment you know as far as Big Bang goes, there's two. Like acknowledging that, that it's not a complete theory yet because there's this, we have to know where the two came from. The fact that the two came and met and did something implies a, a space or a third in which they, they operated. Right? So we have to therefore logically conclude that there's only one primary being, not, not more than one. So it's, it's, it's both ways. Everything emerges from him, A, and then that we just understand that whatever exists only comes from this one. It can't come from another. Following? Before what? You said there's two. The Big Bang theory. It, it, at the moment, the Big Bang theory is two is two particles collide to create the to create the explosion that causes all these chemicals and things to merge. Right? I, I, to my understanding, I'm, I'm not an evolutionary biologist in the slightest. Sorry. But there's a theory that goes. I don't know. I'm saying that, but philosophically, two implies that there is a context in which they exist, right? Is that That's what two implies. Right? Two implies there's, you, you, if you have an absolute singularity where nothing else is there and needs nothing else to be, then it just is, is, right? But once you have two, then you have definition. This one is not that one. And number two is not number one. So when you have number one, that's not number two. Number two, is not number one. That means there's a context in which one stops and two starts. Implying, but not the beginning. There's some other causality to their beingness. So you have to work really farther back to the point where you come to only one. Right, I'm talking about the logical deduction that there must be a primary being, a singular primary being in which everything else comes. This is how he's defining God. He hasn't used the word God. He hasn't used that word yet. He says a primary being in which all beings emerge and nothing and everything that exists emerges from nothing other than the truth of that original being. That's how we define God, right? So they're following. Isn't the Big Bang uh, or is in Caleb and they don't? I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I, I have to make this disclaimer. I do not, under, I, I'm not uh, an evolutionary biologist. I'm, I'm not, I'm only using it as contrast. I'm not, I don't understand it well. And I'm sure if someone who understands evolution better than me will come and disprove everything I just said. It's, it's quite possible. I'm still using the, 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 the philosophy to, to demonstrate what I'm just trying to say. Okay, We're clear so far? So now comes the day, second halach. So this is the fulfillment of the command that there is, that there is a primary being, to know that there's a, he hasn't used the word God yet, but to know there's a God so far, all that means is to know there's a primary being from which everything else emerges and that whatever exists cannot be from anything other than his ultimate, his ultimate being the truth of his being, the absoluteness of his being, right? Let's just make that clear because he uses these words, amitis him so, the truth of his being. What does he mean by truth of his being? We're going to see more soon, but just to explain a little bit now. Truth of his being means I, I am not an absolute true being. My being is conditional. I, I, I live in you, I exist conditionally. 
conditional on air, on food, on my parents being together, right? There's a, there's a thousand trillion conditions that must come together to allow for this being to exist. Right? And at some point, the conditions run out and I'm back to the earth, right? So I'm not an absolutely true being, I'm a conditional being. Why am I a conditional being? Because there are causes that precede me, right? But if God is the primary being from which everything else emerges, if we're talking about a primary being from which everything else emerges, it cannot have any causes. Because if it has a cause, it's not the primary being. The cause before it is the primary being, right? So that primary being, therefore, has to be the only absolute true being. So everything else that exists only exists because this absolute true being says, let there be this, or allows for causality to evolve from it. So everything else that exists only exists predicated on the truth and absolute nature of his being. They are all conditional to him, not the reverse. Clear? Yeah? Okay. Halacha base. Now, the im yalal das, I'm going to translate it first literally, and then I'm going to tell you the Rebbe's, the Rebbe's translation to this line. The Rebbe's a very beautiful translation to this line. The literal translation is like this, on the most basic level. I mean, I shouldn't say the word literal because the Rebbe's translation is also literal. But at least the basic translation, pre the Rebbe's analysis, is like this. If you were to entertain the notion, that this primary being does not exist, then nothing else can exist. Is everything, as we've just finished saying, everything must have a cause. And that cause must also have a cause. And that cause must also have a cause. So you must come down to a primary being. So if you're to entertain the notion that there is no primary being, then you don't have anything from which anything can emerge. Like there, there must be a primary being. Otherwise, how does anything be, how is anything here? From what? Right, spontaneity. It, it, oh, yeah. Yeah. The only thing you can actually maybe contemplate and say there was nothing before and nothing caused it. Right, but what's that nothing? What, what is that nothing? Right, what's that nothing? Right. And what's that? Post that, things develop. Good. We haven't got there yet. Yeah, I'm just saying. Here we're talking about. So we just, you don't have to have the cause and effect necessarily from a unique being. I'm wondering. You, no, you, you made my point even more. Really? Yes, because you only said from that point, you don't have to have a primary being. Thank right. you very much. But where did that point come from? In other words, so philosophically speaking, no matter how, you, once you have the causes and effects in motion, of course you can argue there's no original cause. No, the original but, but that's that. But that's you can't, argue, you can't argue that there's nothing that the millisecond before the Big Bang exactly it ever had caused it to happen. It, it did, but it did. But it caused it. Yeah, it must have. We agreed. Well, because there was nothing. So, so then, so then what's that? There. What's that? So obviously. What's right. that? Whatever that is. It's a primary entity. Primary. That's the point. Right. It's a primary entity from which all other entities emerge. Back to that point. Considering we see causality, we have to deduce that we're going, unless we go back ad infinitum, unless we go back in causality ad infinitum, right? But then again, we have to run into the problem of why the change? Why the change now? Why not the change 100 trillion years ago or in 100 trillion years from now, right? It's a must, I think, also makes another argument, which is. Another, 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 there isn't another, which is why they came up with evolution, because they have to, they have to deduce that the causality, the nature of the effect, cause and effect is such that it comes down to a simple cause. So we haven't got yet to the primary being, which is completely, absolutely simple. We come down to two. We're almost there. But, the, but they have to come down to a beginning because they see a change. Are you, are you sure there is two? My, my understanding of the Big Bang Theory is a singularity. A singularity of, of what? It was a single, a single, an atom that has two, that has two things that. No, it just. No, it's not. Well, what happened? Or something split. So what is it? You know, maybe you know. Maybe it, maybe. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. But the argument still remains the same, I, even though I, I could be wrong about the number two. There's an explanation to it. Mm -hmm. Is that they are, or they're expanding. Yeah. They expand so much until it crushes. Collapses so it in itself. Collapses in yeah. itself. Yeah. Either that's right or it's okay. wrong, but yeah. Okay. Right, but that also implies that something exists before, right? That implies also that something exists before. Okay, so what brought that into being? Yeah. You're, you're always going to go back to a cause that predates the effect that you have, right? 
there was something before that. That's right. So the, the two arguments for why there's no causality ad infinitum in the reverse is number one, as I just mentioned, is because why the change now? If there's always a cause and effect in perpetuity, both in forward and in history, right? So in, in essence, there's no reason why there should be a change now in reality, not a million years ago, a trillion years ago, a hundred trillion years ago, or a hundred trillion years from now, because it's all just in the space of infinity. That's number one. Number two, the second argument that Samach Tzedek makes is like this. This is a brilliant argument, it, but it's so simple, actually. You, you cannot say that there was beingness infinitely backwards, because it's very, very simple. Do it from infinite forward. What's infinite forward? I can infinitely have generations in front of me, right? Right, I can have infinitely generations in front of me. Mm -hmm. But at no point can I get to, to one of my great grandchildren and say, ah, you hit infinite. I can't, because you can always add one more. So the infinity going forward, we all understand is not literal, it's only conceptual. Because so far as our existence is, considering that we are of finite beings, we can only entertain the infinite in potentiality, not in actuality. You can never reach infinite. Now it's, it's don't use people, but use numbers. But it's the same, the argument's the same. You count one, two, three to Google. That's the highest number that, that, that they you know to find. Then you can do Google plus one, or then Google plus two, whatever the number is at the end. Right? There's no point at which you say, oh, I hit infinite. You don't. Because by in, in essence, everything in our in our existence is definitionally finite. And if we can always add to that finite, but you can never actually hit infinite, which is why we say the universe is infinitely expanding. It isn't infinite. It just hasn't stopped expanding. So it hasn't stopped in its finite expansion, but it isn't reached the infinite yet. So if it's true then- Because it's a thing. Because it's a thing. Because it's a thing. Exactly. So if you cannot go infinite forward, how could you possibly go infinite backwards? At, at which point did the infinite start backwards? Right? So me going back to infinite grandparent number one, whatever that is. And, and then that infinite grandparent number one is farther to my great, great grandchild infinite going forward. Why is it farther or closer? And who is that infinite? Right? Be, considering the fact that we are literally lin linearly moving forward, then moving backwards must have a beginning point. Because we, we don't have action. Yes. We only have theoretical infinite. Yes. So we must conclude, reason number two, that there is a primary being which says it starts here or stops here. And then everything emerges. So the notion of change, linear change, implies two things. Number one, A, we never get to infinite, and therefore we can never have come from infinite. And B, change implies that you causality. And causality ad infinitum would mean no change, ironically. So infinite should never change. It cannot change. If it changes, it implies a beginning, a middle, and an end. Before the change, during the change, and after the change, right? So you, you must therefore come to software update. the nature of our physical beingness and the nature of the change the world is going through that it must have had a primary cause from which all other causes emerge. And therefore, he says in Allah number two, if you can entertain the notion that he doesn't, there is no primary cause and nothing else can be. <clears throat> literal translation, literal basic translation of this line. Now I'm going to give you the Rebbe's translation. Beautiful, beautiful translation. Look at the Hebrew, because the Rebbe is going to translate it exactly literally and give us a whole new appreciation. Excuse me, only the Rebbe can do this. Base. The im yalaladas, which we translated before as, if you were to entertain the notion. Shuein imotza that isn't there. Ain't the rachil imotza, nothing else can come from it. Now listen to how the, not, not that nothing else will be able to exist if there is no primary cause. Yeah? This is how the Rebbe translates it. In Yalaladas, if you were to go up in your knowledge and think, Shahu, that he, God, ain't a matzoi, he is a non existent being, he transcends being. So in Halacha, one Rambam said, God is a primary being, giving it a beingness, 
And as a beingness, he can produce all the other beings that we have, this whole universe. What if you're going to be a smart aleph and think to yourself, not just a smart aleph, but you're actually going to think of God in a loftier notion. It's going to go up in your mind. Yalaladas. Up in your mind to think God's transcendent of being a being. He's a nimotsoi. Not that he doesn't exist, but he is a non-being. He's beyond being for his cause. He's beyond creator. It's true. But it can't be the end of who he is. Why? Because nothing else will be. If he's beyond being a being, if he's beyond being a creator, nothing else would have been created. So it's true, dear reader, says the Rebbe, that God is beyond creator, beyond a beingness, beyond being primary being. But he chose to manifest being primary being. How do we know? Look around. Halacha number three. Now here's another another, another uh, logical deduction in a mistaken version of God, which actually exists even today. It's a scary notion, but there are people who believe in it. And one, one should be aware of this, not to get all trapped for this. Now the Imyala Das, Halacha Gemon. If you were to entertain the notion, that nothing other, if you were to think and imagine a such scenario in which nothing else exists, he will still exist alone. Below you explain what he's trying to negate here. He will not cease to be just because all of creation cease to be. All that exists, they need him, they need that primary being. And he, blessed be he, this primary being, doesn't need them. And neither none of any of them. Therefore, his truth is nothing like any other truth. Let's unpack what he's saying. What he's trying to negate is a version of divinity called pantheism. Or to some degree, one can argue he's even arguing against panpsychism. Pantheism is essentially the argument that, that God is the sum total of everything that is. Everything exists, right? Nothing ever goes out of existence. Everything just changes its existence, right? To disintegrate and new things emerge. Right? Which, by the way, it's Matzadik also makes this argument. How do you know there's no humans ad infinitum? Because it, there's no humans infinitely backwards. How do you know that infinitely backwards there's no humans, a creation? Because um, every human must at some point die and disintegrate into the ground. Now, let's say we were to associate one kernel of dust on the earth for every human that ever existed. We still wouldn't reach infinite. So where did all these infinite people go? <laughs> it's a funny little argument to make. Isn't it? I mean, sorry, sorry. So where are we? Okay, so there's, there's this notion of pantheism, which is that everything always exists. Matter, right? It's a, it's a rule of science. Matter cannot be created nor destroyed, right? That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, um, the, the rule of... That's the rule of, of, uh, of matter. You can't destroy it. You only change its form. It goes from a table to becoming uh, compost, right? And then it becomes a tree, and then it becomes an apple, then it goes back to becoming compost. But there's nothing ever is destroyed, right? So if that's the case, some argue that... What do you mean, burnt to the ashes? Right, but it still exists. Everything still exists. It doesn't stop existing. So it becomes, it becomes it goes into the air, it becomes a chemical, it becomes a gas. But it doesn't stop... Yes, it, it can become energy. It can become energy. Right, that, that's uh, Einstein's discovery, right? That, right. That, 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 that mass itself can, be, that can become energy and vice versa. Yes. Right. So, but nothing really goes out of existence. And therefore, the, this philosophy is that is God. This, the, the beingness of all things in their sum totality is God. But he created all of that. So that's what I'm saying. That's, that's the philosophy he's negating here. Right. That don't assume that if the world is gone, so is he. In other words, if God is the sum total of everything's beingness, 
it's, it's not a, it's it's it sounds very holistic it's like okay wow look there's there's a and then when you get to panpsychism, it's even more subtle because panpsychism is this notion that everything has a conscience, like psychs, like psyche, and it per, pervades all, and that's God. God is the sum total of all the consciousness that it pervades all of reality, right? But what that does is, is it, it traps God into the notion of what exists, right? Now, the reason why I say it's a very dangerous philosophy is because from this perspective, there's no such thing as right and wrong. Hitler is no less God than, than, than the biggest saint. What's the difference? It's, if it's all part of existence, right? And, and if it exists, it is God, because God's the sum total of existence. You, you run into huge moral issues. How you define what's right and wrong, right? You start making utilitarian arguments, and utilitarian arguments run into uh, eugenics arguments, and you can run down a very terrible, horrible path, right? But the main argument he's making here, again, comes from, from the original main point, which is we see causality. And causality implies a start, a start that's beyond the causality. Because if that start is in the causality, then it too has a cause. Right? And therefore, his being is not dependent on their being there, but the reverse. Their being is dependent on his being there as the primary being. Right? And this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. I am, and that's why it ends up at the end. Therefore, his truth is nothing like anybody else's truth. Because my truth is conditional. Conditioned to the causes that will lead to the effect called me. So I'm, a, I'm extremely fragile and extremely conditional. Right? The most basic of conditions all beings need to exist is a space. A conceptual space. Right? Ideas need to have a certain room in which they exist. Ideas have to have the rules of math that say, okay, this idea can exist, or the rules of physics that say this idea can exist. Right? Everything, even music, has to have a certain space. It has to have a certain, you know, there's, there's theoretical notes and sounds that come together to make music, right? There, there's a context or space that allows for everything to be. So everything that is, is a conditional being. If not on things that preceded it, it's conditional on there being space for it. Right? Implying that there's everything has some sort of cause outside of it that allows for it to be until you come to the original cause. And that original cause cannot be conditional on anything that exists. And thus it is the only absolute truth is this primary being. Everything else is only true so far as the primary being says you can be. So far as that primary being says the conditions for your existence are allowed, good, you're here. And if the primary being decides to change the causality, you're not here. So the truth of everything is nothing like the truth of Hashem himself or the primary being as he calls it here. Clear so far? Okay. Now, finally, in Halacha Dalit, now he says the word God. So now he's been using the word primary being. Now he says, Hu This is what the prophet says, Ba'ashem malikim emes. God, the Lord, is true. What does, that, that nothing else exists? What does he mean by true? What he means by God being true, says the Rambam, huh? what he means is, he alone is the absolute truth. And nothing else has truth like his truth. Because his truth, the primary being's truth, is unconditional. It is because it is. Whereas everything else has a thousand other becauses for why they exist. So they aren't real truth. For conditional truth. And this is what Torah says, there's nothing other than him. Explains Rambam, and this is where again, Chassidus will take it to another level. But Rambam explains, meaning to say, nothing else is true like his being. In other words, Chassidus takes it quite, almost like, quite literally, that there's nothing other than Hashem. You see a world, it's, 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 not, it's not there, but it's all within Hashem. It's all nullified to his being, right? That's another level. But here he's saying, just on a basic level, the absolute nature of the oneness of Hashem, the absolute nature of Hashem's truth, and that it's an a being that requires no conditions for existence, implies that he's the only truth on the absolute sense. And everything else has truth, but not like his, because everything else's truth is conditional. Right? 
And now he makes the argument that we, that we mentioned earlier about change. So we'll do two more halachas and then we'll stop. Because then, because this, the next two halachas concludes this mitzvah to know that there is a God. And then next week we'll look at the other mitzvah, which is the mitzvah to understand the oneness of Hashem, the nature of God's oneness that we'll get to next week. So, Hamatzah Azeh, this primary being, <coughs> this is the God of the universe, master of all the earth. So now that you know, in other words, it, 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 it's so great because he doesn't tell you this is why the God is, why should you believe in God? Because you use the word God for many people to trigger and they're just not listening anymore. So Ramam doesn't even use the word God. It says, okay, there's a primary being. We, we, can we agree on that? Good. Can we, agree, can we agree that there's a primary cause and that this primary cause must exist for everything else to exist and, da, 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 and so on and so forth? Okay, good. That thing that we all agreed exists, that's God. Why do you say that in dollars? Then dollars. Then that should be the other way around. First day. Then dollars. Mm, okay. Then okay, okay. Well, because, because so far, he described God as a primary being, but he didn't describe God as an investment, as, as being invested in creation. Primary being, which everything else emerges, but that, but that that primary being involved himself in what's happening at the end of the causality, me and you, the humans. So far, we haven't had an argument for that. We haven't had an argument for God's investor in creation. We've only made the arguments for a primary being, right? But now we're saying that this primary being also becomes a don kal arats, master of the earth. So he's not just a primary being from which everything else emerges, which maybe evolutionary thinkers might agree with. This next stage, they may not agree with. Because what should you call him? He's, he's the word existence. Motsi means he's found. I'm, I'm using the word being, but maybe in existence. A primary existence, a primary entity, an entity, primary entity, primary being, primary existence. Yeah, Motsi means found, it, it's there. So now we're making the next argument that God is actually involved in creation. I've done Kalaretz, he's the primary being, we, we've established that it's there, there's a primary being. But if we stopped here, we would say, okay, God's the primary cause for all that follows. But all that follows is not connected to that original primary being, and the primary being doesn't care. If we're going to use the evolutionary argument, okay, good. So there is a primary being that doesn't change and made everything else come from it. But why should I listen to it? Or why should it matter to me? It's trillion years ago, whenever it started. Right? And he says, no, this is Adon Kal Aretz, master of the earth. What's the argument for this? He moves the spheres of the universe. We see the universe moving on a global scale. And that movement is infinite. This is what we see. We observe this. We can observe infinite expansion. We observe infinite movement. With a power that has no end. The earth is rotating continuously. The, all the various different spheres are rotating continuously. It cannot move without a mover. And he, blessed be, Moves it without having a body or a hand. We'll explain export this means he has no body or hand soon. We'll explain that in later halachas we get to the one of Svashev. But over here, let's make this point, and we'll stop over here because this point actually will be explored even more soon. The point is like this. It's, it's going to become clearer also. Uh, maybe it's in maybe it's in chapter two. Yeah, in chapter two, he makes that point, which is like this. And Semach Tzedek elaborates on this in Derek in, in Sefer HaKira. A, a, a limited being that's physically limited cannot contain infinite energy. It cannot. It, sorry? Because you're a limited body. A limited body cannot have a nefesh that's infinite. A limited being cannot contain possibilities of infinite. Can't. Right? Because you're, you're limited to the, 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 if you can use the words mass and energy, the, the energy is limited to the space of the mass, finished. Right? And, the, and the mass only exists conditional to the energy that's available for it. You cannot have a physical mass that has a beginning point, end point, contained within it, the possibility for infinite energy. Right? Which means that there has to be a, and, and therefore if we observe infinite movement in limited physical beings, we must conclude there is an infinite being that is not subject to the rules of the limited being you are and gives you that infinite movement. So if we see the universe infinitely moving and not getting weaker over time, 
then we must conclude that there is a, that this primary being, which is not conditional to everything else's existence, we already established, it's the absolute from which everything else emerges. And now we see that in that emergent life, there is an element of that infinite. Because we observe in that emergent life, this universe, infinite rotation, infinite movement, infinite expansion. We must therefore conclude that it's, that, that's right. That the primary being, which is not subject to the li limitations of the universe, is injecting into the universe a notion of keep on going infinitely. It's somehow that makes the argument of having children also. As a limited finite being, I should not contain the potential to have infinite generations. I should only, I should be able to produce the same much as myself or less. So how can one couple have 10 children and those 10 have also 10 and also have 10? So potentially speaking, my DNA encoded in it has infinite generations of humans. So how does a limited being, limited by this literal space right here, contain within it infinite energy for infinite reproduction? Only if the primary cause, which itself is not subject to the rules of that which emerged, says, you are putting infinite there. Movement and expansion, I'm giving infinite movement and expansion. So now we conclude that the primary being not just predates everything that exists because it's their primary cause, but the primary cause must remain the master of the universe to allow for whatever he decides to have infinite movement, infinite change, and infinite reproduction, and so on. Because by nature of our limitation, we should be getting less, not more. There should be slowly less humans on the planet, not slowly more humans on the planet. Because we should be, our, our potential should be waning, not gaining momentum. So for getting more and the physical nature of me contains the potential for infinite, and there must be a relationship with that infinite still present. And thus, that primary being, which predates and pre-exists all the causalities, is not just there and allowing everything to run on its own, but remains invested, master of the world, as he says it here, in that creation. So even in Goya Shem, even, uh, That's right. Koya Chen, so if this the power for giving not for reproduction. Cows also have it. Cows can also reproduce for infinite. The power of reproduction is one of the manners in which the Ein Soif injects its presence in creation. The infinite injects its power into the reproductive system, into reproductive capacity that we can reproduce infinitely. And, and the infinite nature of my father's reproduction doesn't diminish my infinite nature of my reproduction. I can have infinite grandkids and so can he even have grandkids. Because each one of them individually, as limited beings, contain within it the infinite possibility. And that's only possible if that original infinite being is still invested to allow for that. Because if it was just causality, it would slowly dissipate as it runs out of energy. So this is the first half, the first myth, which is to know there is a God. And we conclude is number one, it, it, it's it's an absolute being that has no reason for exist, for existing. It just is because it is. And everything else's reason for existing is ultimately from that cause. And B, that that original primary being remains invested in creation to allow for certain possibilities of infinite within creation. God willing, next week, we're going to get to the nature of Hashem oneness, the next mitzvah, which is what do we mean when we say Hashem Echad, God's one? That God willing, coming next week. Okay, wonderful week. You know, good night, evening.